afternoon. It's my pleasure to be here uh, in Dubai for the first time. And as was mentioned, I will tell you about infectious disease. And you should all be worried because all of you as you're sitting here today, you are carrying the bugs that I'll talk about in you. Not all of them, but you will carry some of them in you. And we talk about a future here, and the future in the area of infectious disease is not bright. Today, we lose about 8 million people globally to cancer. And in 2050, we got to lose more than that to infectious disease that will be resistant to antimicrobial treatments. So if we don't start to do something right now, we will have a major problem on our hands. And that problem will be a global problem. It will be a problem that will be major in Asia and Africa, but it will hit every country around the globe. So it is a global concern, and it will need global engagement at the level of governments. So there are a large number of pathogens. And some of you may have heard of, and other ones you've never heard of, but it can become a huge problem for you. Tuberculosis is something that's been well known, and millions of people die every year. Klebsiella pneumonia, on the other hand, many of you may never have heard of. But even if you go to the best hospitals in the US, in the UK, in Europe, or Middle East, if you get Klebsiella pneumonia, your chance of dying is 50% today. So that is a concern. If you don't do anything about it, we have a serious issue. We have epidemics, influenza was mentioned earlier, malaria, cholera, both persist, and we have problems with animals. We, to this day, live with animals and we consume animal meat. And if we don't treat animals and prevent infectious diseases in those animals, we will have more problems with resistance coming in. So treatment is one option. But ideally, we should prevent people from getting sick by vaccination. And vaccination is the um, least expensive means to protect people from infectious disease at the level of an uh, entire population. The WHO, the World Health Organization, reports that we are today saving 2.5 million lives of children because you're using vaccines. So that's the good news. The other good news is that in the US, for example, where there is a high rate of vaccination, they can reduce infections in children by over 90% by using vaccines. And we can see the success of vaccines, not very well here, but basically you can see we used to lose about a million children worldwide to measles. And today we are below 200,000 just because we are having a great um, success with those vaccines. Of course, there are constantly new diseases coming in, but we are doing fairly well on the old ones. One problem we face globally is access to vaccines. To many of you, your children will be vaccinated because you will live probably in wealthy countries, you have enough money to have them vaccinated, and there is access. But access can be an issue, and it can be an issue because of a lack of adequate healthcare structures. There can be an issue of vaccine integrity. It's not as easy as just bringing you to Dubai or in Berlin, Germany, where I live, and we just go to a hospital and we get a vaccine. In rural areas, in some countries, it's difficult to maintain a cold chain that is required for many of those vaccines. And by the end of the day, we have to provide those vaccines at very low prices. Now, to develop a vaccine will cost us between 1 billion and 1.2 billion US dollars. But by the end of the day, they should be affordable for everybody in the world. And if you take a look at the uh, number of people vaccinated versus the income of the country, there's a clear correlation that poor countries have less vaccines that are being used. There are many vaccines around, and for things like polio and measles today, we are in the high 80s um, as far as percentage of vaccination is concerned. So many people in the world get access. But the other things have been in the market for 25 years, such as Haemophilus influenza, and that vaccine is only being used in about 64% of cases. So we are losing to this day millions of children that die completely unnecessarily. If they would be vaccinated, they wouldn't have to die and wouldn't get sick. And sickness means, of course, we have to treat, and that again costs us money. So if we would spend more money on vaccination early on, we'd be saving money down the line because we would not have to treatment, treat them. 
of course, where diseases such as tuberculosis, where we have treatments, we are lengthy, we have even vaccines, but there are drug resistance strains showing up. Showing up first in Russia, India, and now starting to spread all over the globe. I don't want to scare you, but those diseases are spreading and they're becoming an increasing issue. So I spoke about vaccines. What does a vaccine do? Vaccine is conceptually very simple. All it has to do, it has to basically prime the body to create some response to the pathogen that comes into you. And we used to do this by using a live vaccine, so take the bug, weaken it, and put it in. Then we start taking small pieces of it, and on this busy slide, you basically see the different approaches that just mean that we take different parts of a bug to give it to people. And there are issues with that. Nobody wants to take a live bug, okay? You want to have something dead put into you. And so I'm a basic researcher originally in the medical field, and we are developing sugars. I ask myself, sugars? Why do they want to use um, sugars? Well, because all of us, we are surrounded by sugars, by carbohydrates, long sugar chains. Plants are made of sugar, but also the surrounding of our cells are sugars. So the black layer out here, the so-called glycocalyx, that glycocalyx differs from bug to bug, and it differs from normal cells to cancer cells. So if I can somehow educate the human immune system to recognize those carbohydrates as foreign, make an immune response, then every time a bacterium or something else comes in your body, it will be recognized by the carbohydrates and the bug will be killed. So that's the theory. Now, that theory has been proven, and it's a huge success, both in saving lives and also in making lots of money. Because carbohydrate-based vaccines have been used since the early 1990s, first against Haemophilus influenza type B. You may have never heard about it, but if you get it or your child gets it, the chance of dying or having serious issues is very, very high. Meningitis was a second vaccine, and a big blockbuster is against Streptococcus pneumonia. The Streptococcus vaccine by Pfizer fetched 6.4 billion US dollars last year. And I mention this number because this is important. People like me who work on vaccines always kind of hear, yeah, you work on vaccines, it costs a lot of money, but by the end of the day, nobody is going to make any money back, so why should we spend the money? Today, when we talk to people, they say, well, if we spend one billion making it, we can make five billion back afterwards. That's a business proposition, but many people say, okay, that makes sense. We make people healthy, prevent disease, and we can make money. So if that's such a good thing, why haven't people made more such vaccines? Why do we have only three of them? All the bugs have carbohydrates on the surface. So let's just go do that. Well, because it's not so easy. It's conceptually easy, but technically difficult. So the idea is you grow the bacterium, you take the carbohydrates from its surface, and you make a vaccine out of that carbohydrate. So far, so easy. The problem is that many bugs don't like to grow. And even if they do grow, it's very hard, technically, to purify the carbohydrate. And the Pfizer company took over 20 years to develop Prevnar as a vaccine. So that's what brings people like me in the game. I'm a chemist by training. You say, why don't we, pur we purify it? We're just going to make the carbohydrate from scratch. Again, that sounds totally easy, but it used to take five trained PhDs two years to make a carbohydrate. So my early work at MIT, as a professor there, I started to totally revolutionize the chemistry of carbohydrates to a point where today anyone in this room, after one day training with me, would be able to make a carbohydrate in one day, but it used to take five PhDs, two years. So through that technical um, revolution, we were able to create the carbohydrates and bring them to make vaccines, to make diagnostics, and to make antibodies. And in these areas, we started multiple companies to bring this actually into a market in the US and in Europe. I will focus only on vaccines in this case. And one of the areas, as I mentioned, we work on are veterinary vaccines. Because in many countries, people still live closely with livestock. It's not necessarily the case in all the people in this room here. But zoonoses are a serious issue because there can be transmission from animals um, to humans. You might think it doesn't affect me because I don't live close to animals and all the things I eat are totally clean. Well, I've got bad news for you. If you eat chicken, 
And you happen to buy that in the UK, and for UK I have a number, and there's Kerry, and for Germany I have the same, and I assume they are probably the same everywhere else. Over 70% of chicken sold in the UK, Germany, or the US is contaminated Campylobacter trichunae. If you don't properly cook your meat, you're going to have a serious issue. And I got it at a restaurant once, and I tell you, it's no fun. You don't want it, okay? So we really um, need to do something, and today there is no effective prevention strategy. So we need to make vaccines, and as we speak, we are working in this area. Okay, so you say, well, I'm a vegetarian, I don't eat any meat and no poultry, so I'm, I'm not at risk. Well, again, the news is that you are at risk of suffering from Streptococcus pneumonia. Streptococcus pneumonia resides in all of your nasal areas today, unless you took antibiotics for the last four or five days. Otherwise, you carry it. Don't worry. Probably won't kill you today, but it will kill some of us someday. To this day, in all the developed countries, people are dying from Streptococcus pneumonia. It's mainly the elderly in our countries, but Streptococcus pneumonia today kills more children in Africa than malaria and HIV combined. So it's a serious issue, even though there is a vaccine available. And so what we have looked at is we have looked at improving the existing vaccines. By doing a lot of basic research having to do with boosting the immune system, developing new ways um, of advancing those things, I won't go into technical details, but a lot of work has been done in this area, and we can today expand existing vaccines to have new strains contained in those vaccines. The vaccines sold by Pfizer today carry only 13 of the serotypes that are around. But there are 96 different known serotypes, and the serotypes are different in the US, in Germany, in the Middle East. So one vaccine cannot cover all the people globally in the same way. So right now we're working on special formulations to cover people against these diseases in better ways. Now, when I, I've worked on vaccines for 25 years, and I talk to surgeons and I always ask him, what's the next thing that you really need? And five years ago, one of the surgeons at the Charité, the biggest and most famous hospital maybe in Germany, he said, well, we really need something for Klebsiella pneumonia. I said, Klebsiella what? He said, well, Klebsiella pneumonia. <laughs> I'm just a chemist, right, what I know. He said, well, Peter, this is a serious issue. It's coming from Eastern Europe to us, and we are losing uh, patients to that. And if you read the news, when last year maybe you came across an article where you heard that in the US a young woman had died, and she had been treated with 29 different antibiotics, and none of those antibiotics worked anymore. And this is starting to spread. This is starting to spread quickly, and it's in most major hospitals, and it's a major, major issue. So we really need something, and the bad news here is we don't have anything, and there's nothing on the horizon. There are right now no clinical trials against Klebsiella pneumonia. And once we end the clinical trials, we will take likely another five years to bring it to market. And that's not the only one. There are other things I won't talk about where we have issues. So basic research and Max Planck, which we did starting five years ago, was translated into a company, Vaxelon, which was funded initially with 30 million uh, euros to get started. And that company is now pushing this forward. They doubled last year in size. They're going to again probably double this year in size to bring this forward. But the news again is that even a company that's relatively well funded for a small one cannot do this alone because the cost to bring it to market so that you and your children and your relatives can use it will take about one billion. It will take a total time of about another eight to nine years to do this. But we're on a good way um, to get there. So, I talk about vaccination, and maybe somebody in the audience thinks, yeah, 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 you tell us you vaccinate, but what about all these other problems? You hear about autism, and we hear about all these other things and risks of vaccination. Now, these anti-vaccine campaigns are nothing new. This is a picture that's 100 years old, okay? So people worry about this. And yes, of course, you have children, you want the best for them, you don't want to do anything to them that could harm them. But today, the WHO, and these are not my data, but WHO in 2019, considers the anti-vaccine campaign as one of the biggest threats to human health on this planet. If you just do a risk-benefit analysis for scientists, then you're going to come to a conclusion that if you do not vaccinate my children and they get sick, the chance of them something really bad happening to them is much higher than the risk of having an adverse effect during vaccination, which is very, very low. 
So the key to solve a problem resides with the governments. The governments have to think about, do we want to do something about this global threat? It's a serious threat. It's going to be everywhere, and it's independent of income. It can hit any of us. So this serious problem will only become worse. It will become much, much worse. And maybe you say, well, this guy's just optimistic because he wants to get money to push this forward. Well, the problem is you don't believe it now, we will suffer down the line because this takes time to develop things. The vaccine technology exists today to address a problem and in many cases to solve the problem. The question is just, do we actually want to do this? I just put on one other point in there. This is immense business potential. If we invest in this today, the market for these types of vaccines is in the hundreds of billions of dollars per year down the line. So you're creating good health, you're protecting people, and you can make a lot of money. But this is a level of government. If a government acts today and decides we want to have vaccine programs, we want to do this, you can implement it now. With that, I'd like to thank the people who worked with me. It's a group of 90 people from engineers and chemists all the way over to people who were testing in animals and then humans over to medical doctors and Max Planck, 17 different nations um, working on this project. Um, these are means of how you can get in touch with me and I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.